I may. Uh, well, first of all, I mean, thank you for this go gorgeous introduction. Uh, it is unfair because it's uh, too uh, too kind to me. Um, and of course, I stress that I am not an official advisor. I have chosen my life to be a free man, which is uh, very expensive, I must say, in all countries of the world, including Russia. But I managed. Um, now, however. Uh, I try to uh, give my views to my government as well as uh, the governments all over the world because I believe that we need a fresh look. And that's what I am trying, I'll be trying to uh, uh, deliver here. Uh, but of course, I am, again, I'm uh, pleased to be here and it's a great honor for me to uh, have a, such a distinguished group of listeners here. And uh, I'm happy for, to be invited by Sanjaya, who's not only one of the best thinkers of India and probably the best known thinker, uh, foreign policy thinker of India and now the outside world, who has grown to become uh, uh, the head of what is in Russia called the trade union of oligarchs. Uh, uh, though we, uh, thanks God, Sanjaya told me that, I mean, this institution was uh, established, uh, I mean, um, uh, long ago as a, um, uh, one of the institutions of businessmen who fought for freedom. So, I mean, you have a kinder uh, attitude towards your uh, businesses than we do. Uh, but anyway, um, I'll try to uh, tell a few words about what, ha from my point of view, from one of you are Russian, or rather, as we consider ourselves a northern Eurasianist, a, a person from northern Eurasia, how do I look at the world? And um, uh, uh, it will be, of course, different, but we have, in this world where we have become really global in the strategic terms, uh, where we're getting deglobalized in economic terms, uh, we have uh, to look at the, uh, the world from different angles. We are present. Uh, at uh, uh, a period of uh, disruption, of all of most of the international system which we have, we have inherited. Whether it is also a constructive disruption, whether it will be, uh, we will be building something, is de totally dependent on us. And it's all dependent on Russia, India, China, and other countries even more than we presume. Uh, uh, there of course, uh, you know, when you read about what is happening in the world, you see that there is a chaos in the minds, which is one of the problems we are facing. People do not understand what is happening. So I'll give you the interpretation. Uh, so the systems which are collapsing are uh, the system which, we have, as we have said, we have inherited from the previous world. The main cause, deepens cause of what is being, what is happening is the demise of the Western military superiority. It happened, and it, and it underlies most of the changes uh, which we are witnessing. That happened uh, actually in the 50s when first Russia, then China acquired nuclear weapons. Uh, but it didn't come to the fore until very late. I mean, uh, we, uh, still it was believed that the United States and the West is militarily predominant. Uh, and, and it's only in, uh, 10 years ago when after a series of uh, failures uh, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Libya, uh, people started to understand that the time of Western superiority is over. But uh, the Western predominance in cultural, political, economic fields ideological fields, was based exactly on that superiority. Let, me, let us remind us uh, that between, before 16th century, when uh, due to the fact that uh, Europeans were fighting each other uh, on a very dense subcontinent and uh, developed uh, uh, better than others the technology of war fighting, uh, the powder was, of course, created not in Europe, where gunpowder, but the, we, uh, we Europeans, I mean, started to use it much more effectively. It's not until then that uh, West has become predominant culturally than politically uh, in in the world. Most of the inven great inventions before that were done uh, in Asia, in Arab world, in China, in India. 
Uh, it was only after that when the GDP, uh, the basis of that military predominance, started to flow to Europe, and then to Europe and the United States, uh, that, I mean, the Europe and the United States have become, I mean, the centers of technological and spiritual uh, 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 innovation. But that has st been stopped. Uh, that spirit is over. Uh, as I've said, it's only now it is coming to the fore of the international agenda. I would say that the advent of nuclear weapons was the most important uh, event in the history of the 20th century and maybe in the history of humanity. It changed uh, the context in which we work. Uh, so by the way, uh, saying that Russia, uh, that West is, uh, Western military dominance is over, uh, it is not that I am triumphant. Russia was a part of the West. And the fact that in 65 years we have conquered the land from Urals uh, to Kamchatka to the Far East was not, uh, not only due uh, to the gallantry of Russian Cossacks uh, or their love for freedom from oppression uh, in proper Russia, but also because they had guns and they were able to overwhelm uh, the local tribes. And the Russian conquer of uh, the Central Asia uh, was also due to the same uh, fact. Uh, so, uh, uh, on a, a crucial moment, <coughs> uh, of course, came uh, somewhere in the 50s, in the 50s, 60s, but it's only now that we are starting uh, to understand that. Uh, the, the second crucial moment uh, came on the background of that shift, and it came to the fore in 2008 when uh, the world economic crisis uh, started. Uh, it, was, so it, was, uh, uh, it started uh, mostly in the West this time and was due for two main sources. One is that others, including China, India, uh, countries of ASEAN, uh, without the pressure, uh, military pressure from outside, started to grow much faster. It would have been absolutely impossible to believe that if not for this factor which I have mentioned, that China would have given a possibility of rise and maybe even India would have been stopped. Uh, but in 2008, uh, the crisis stopped, which show, start, economic crisis started, which is continuing until now, which showed that the old system, which was created uh, 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 on the base of uh, Western economic dominance, is crumbling without the support of the, uh, dom uh, of the military dominance. Uh, the liberal trade order started to falter. The liberal economic order was introduced, as we all know, in Bretton Woods, 45, 44, 45, 46, and uh, it was, ba and it was uh, at that time it was spread only in the Western world. I mean, India, not even much to India. Uh, then it spread to all over the world when uh, Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, there was, I mean, a part of the world where well, liberal economic order was not. Uh, dominant. Uh, but it benefited, first of all, uh, mostly, of course, those who uh, uh, wrote the rules. Uh, first, it was Great Britain, free trade, well, for obvious reasons, then the United States, dominant on the seas, and uh, it was the dominant power economically. Uh, but during the last several last decades, the new, because again of the um, uh, uh, of the blind alley in the military political field has been able to grow. And uh, it is now the old world uh, which is turning against uh, our uh, liberal world order, economic world order. I'm sorry. Uh, we all see the reaction of the Trump, but Trump is a caricature reaction of his protectionism, his uh, 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 is a caricature to their mood which is, has been everywhere in the United States before. They were unhappy uh, about the uh, fact that uh, the new are growing faster and they are competing for the markets much more uh, effectively. Uh, so the liberal uh, world order is also uh, dwindling away. Of course, I mean, countries like China, India, others are still interested in it, but we all see uh, that it is uh, being fragmented, uh, and uh, the protection is on the rise from different sources. 
and we see uh, the weaponization of international economic relations. Sanctions uh, are becoming a normal, normal tool of international affairs. Why? Uh, not only because, I mean, uh, certain countries are against certain countries. I mean, India also uses sanctions. Russia, Russia also uses sanctions, but on a massive scale. And by the way, uh, more than 60 countries are now victims of sanctions, and hundreds of them are being imposed. Uh, it is simply because, uh, and it is explained almost openly, because you could not use military force anymore. So it is uh, using by force by other means. Uh, so even in the culture, uh, things are uh, happening and are going to help in, in the ideology uh, and change very rapidly. The world history, as we know it, uh, was written by the victors, uh, Europeans. And even <laughs> uh, we, we now learn, even now, and it's, uh, I am uh, sorry for uh, being so badly educated about the great thinking of, of uh, India, from uh, from Henry Kissinger, but Henry Kissinger could be excused. He's a genius. Mm -hmm. uh, but we know, I mean, the world history. I mean, as it was written by others. I mean, and in this world history, I mean, India was backward. I mean, somewhere there. I mean, dirty. I mean, uh, China Chinese were uh, smoking opium. Uh, and uh, the glorious Byzantium, which was the heir of the, uh, actually the Eastern uh, Roman Empire and uh, the successor to the Roman Empire, which was the, the epitome there of the European cultures, believe, believing to be something ugly, uh, uh, Byzantium, uh, uh, something ugly, sophisti I mean, uh, unsophisticated, while we'll, now we are starting to understand that these were three uh, pr most prominent civilization, maybe plus f Persia, say between 7th and uh, 13th century. And that will be known to our children. Uh, and uh, it will be, uh, for, by the way, for us it will be also a problem because we are part of the Western civilization as well as uh, 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 very much so, though we are trying to adapt. And in the future world, I mean, the history of Indian uh, dynasties or Chinese dynasties will be as important as the history of Stuarts, uh, Habsburg, or even Romanovs. Uh, so we are living, uh, we are moving also to a different, to a cultural world. Uh, so a liberal world, cultural world, um, security world, and of course we are also witnessing a collapse, a uh, one more world order, which lasted only 17 years, from 1991. Uh, 208, there was a very interesting period in the world history. Uh, it was uh, sometimes called uh, one polar world. It was called a liberal world order. Uh, uh, when uh, the West, and especially the United States, obtained almost total uh, dominance in international affairs. Uh, that is collapsing or have, uh, right away or already starting to uh, already collapsed. And of course here, I must say, Russia is now, as you know, I will address that a bit later, is blamed for everything. But here, I think we played a role. And we are proud to play the role in uh, doing away with uh, that particular order, which gives, uh, gives uh, all countries uh, much more freedom to develop as they want, uh, to develop their cultures, to develop their political systems without um, outside uh, interference. Uh, we are witnessing also, I mean, the slowing collapse, I mean, uh, up and with us and down of the bipolar world order. Uh, at first, uh, it was supplanted by uh, this one polar world. Now it is, people are trying to recreate it in Europe by building up uh, tensions there, and we could uh, talk about uh, later, uh, in Asia by uh, building up uh, a uh, line of containment around China. Uh, but it is highly unlikely that uh, the uh, bipolar world will be returned. Uh, also because the bi previous bipolar world, and by the way, and not China, and not Russia doesn't want that bipolar world to return. We know who are willing uh, uh, this, uh, this bipolar world to return. Uh, but um, our calculations tell us that if it is indeed imposed on the world, uh, it will not be, uh, 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 it will not uh, benefit those who have 
allegedly won the previous bipolar uh, confrontation. The correlation of forces has changed dramatically. And if there is a bipolar world, it's highly likely uh, that this time the new uh, world, including Russia, uh, China, uh, many others, uh, India is a separate uh, entity, but still it belongs to that world. It doesn't want to take uh, uh, place in the new confrontation. Uh, that this time uh, it will, this other world would uh, benefit uh, from it. So that's why that is why I think uh, the ideas of again the new bipolarism uh, uh, doom. Uh, again, there is a now I'm c c coming close to your heart, uh, talking about China. Uh, I know, of course, your. Dense, dense feelings. We have uh, we are much more benevolent toward China, but we believe that uh, China in 15 years will become, in cumulative power, uh, the nation number one in the world. Of course, you see, you see Xi Jinping uh, tells us, as usually they are underestimating their uh, their uh, power, that it will happen happen only in by 2015, but most likely it will happen um, uh, before. Uh, uh, pressure from the East have uh, uh, pushed China towards continental strategy. It's moving east and southwest, which creates and uh, south uh, west and southwest. I'm sorry, which creates some problems for India. But uh, we have to th we'll think about these problems later, probably in our uh, conversation. Uh, but for Russia, it is uh, it creates a huge window of opportunity. Uh, China is a powerful country, but it's still very much depend on our strategic might. And we have a balanced relationship. We have a balanced relationship for at least a few years. Uh, what will come out of it, and a very friendly one, that will come out of it is an open question, but uh, we could manage to um, build uh, a positive uh, world, continental uh, world order and world order. But of course, I will dwell with that uh, a bit uh, later. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, so uh, now I'm coming to the position of the West. As I've said, uh, there has been unheard in history only once, and actually it was her. The Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. Then it was a very drastic uh, change of correlation of forces in the world. Now it is being uh, cured. Uh, but what happened uh, during the last decade has been uh, almost a collapse of political and economic positions of the West and moral positions of the West. And th that's what we are witnessing uh, now. Uh, and the reaction uh, to this collapse uh, is exactly the reason for uh, current tensions between Russia and the West uh, and current processes which are happening in our, um, among our Western neighbors and friends. Uh, 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 first, uh, is, uh, uh, if you look at what is happening in the United States, I mean, a civil war, but I mean, as I will say, not armed civil war between the elites. It could be explained by different means, but one of the explanations is for the first time in, uh, in American history, almost for the first time in American history since civil war of uh, the previous century, uh, uh, American elite lost control of uh, the population for many, many reasons, also reaction to globalization, but also because American type of democracy uh, uh, ha, uh, has, been, has uh, not enabled the elite so far uh, to master the control of the political process, uh, which are now being driven away. The control is driven away or taken away by social media. And what you see uh, is a desperate attempt to take control of a American political processes. For that, they need an enemy, of course. Uh, and this enemy is uh, is here. It's me. It's us, the Russians. Because first of all, I mean, it's too expensive to fight you immediately uh, the Chinese because I mean of the interdependence. And second, I mean because Russians are mm, uh, an easier uh, target. I mean, it, they have it in almost. They have this hatred almost in its genes. Uh, but I mean. Going back to the fact that we are now condemned by for everything in which is happening bad in the United States and with the United States, I said and especially uh, we're condemned for um, uh, uh, intrusion into internal affairs of the United States. I could sincerely 
admit, if 1% of what we, will, w we are accused would have been true, I would have been a happy and proud man. Uh, because uh, that means that we are really, I mean, uh, I mean, wise, strong. I think it's less than 1%. Uh, and, uh, and also, I, I would hope that it would, would have been 1%, because our Americans, partners, colleagues, and friends uh, should be uh, educated not to interfere in the affairs of other countries, which they, we, they have been doing uh, for quite some time, sometimes, most, most of the times during the last decades, bring chaos and misery uh, to the nations where they interfered, uh, starting from Iraq, Libya, name others, uh, ending up with Ukraine, where, uh, which is going on the, down the drain and is becoming uh, a failed uh, power. Uh, naturally, of course, uh, the irritation against Russia and, this, and the run of the Cold War with Russia is also based on the a uh, fact which I have mentioned at the beginning of my conversation, and that is that Russia is uh, the main reason of the loss of the military superiority. And we uh, intend uh, not to allow others to get this military superiority, because we think we, at one point in our history, because of our internal collapse, because of the illusions and stupidity of the 90s, uh, we ceased to be a deterrent power. And we had, I mean, uh, what we had, and that is, I mean, uh, the law of the jungle where the tiger was the west without any rules attacking. Uh, the worst was, of course, oh, the worst was attack on former Yugoslavia, now Serbia, when for 78 days a peaceful democratic country was bombed, I mean, out of the blue. And it was, uh, then, of course, came Iraq under totally false protects. We saw what that world without deterrence works. So we will not allow that um, in the way. Uh, so uh, the, Europe, Europe, the situation in Europe is quite different, but it is basically, again, the loss of the uh, capacity of the modern elite under the modern democracy of European type uh, to govern effectively. And that is why, I mean, again, uh, on the on one, uh, there are many, uh, of course, problems which are borne by that. But on the one level, and it's on Russian level, and I'm a Russian, I have to refer to my own uh, to our own experience. We are uh, accused of Brexit of all things. I mean, we are accused of uh, of the try of Catalan independence uh, two days ago before uh, Macron's. Uh, election, I mean, uh, files were published, something like two gig, I mean, uh, three gigabytes, which you couldn't read, the alleged interference of Russia into French internal affairs. Again, we feel ourselves omnipotent, but that is totally false. And that continues. Uh, so, but that is the way things are. We have to be benevolent, and we are, to a certain extent. We, are not, we will not allow our friends to get military superiority and to return uh, to the ways which they uh, uh, showed us uh, in the previous two decades, uh, but we shall wait out and hopefully uh, somehow uh, elites will reform themselves and uh, take control uh, of the situation in their own countries or else be changed. In the meantime, one more important feature of the current international disorder is that if uh, 25 years ago uh, uh, Karaganovs, uh, Sergei Karaganovs and, uh, and Sanjayas of the world were saying that uh, seriously talking about the necessity uh, to govern or to control the uh, rise of the rest. Now I think we should talk about controlling and regulating uh, the decline of the old. That is a new situation in the world uh, to which we have to adjust ourselves. Uh, because that puts on us and on you in India new responsibility, whether you are ready for that or not, I'm not sure, but I mean that is the new uh, new reality. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, Russia uh, uh, in the, in China, less India because you are maneuvering very cleverly, are accused of revi revisionism. Well, 
to a certain extent, yes, we used to be. But I think uh, countries like Russia, China, and Lydia are becoming the countries of the new status quo. Uh, it is uh, the West which resists the new status quo. We are moving, I think, with all my, our, our concerns, Russia, the countries like Russia, India, and China like the direction of world development. Though, of course, we have to be wise to govern that direction and to, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll see what comes out of it. On, on, that, on that background, we face unprecedented security challenges. I'm, as Sanjaya told, uh, uh, was for many years a specialist on hard security. And I must say that never, and I'm a historian of Cold War, um, and I've said that never in, uh, since, say, 50, 64, 65, had we had a, a chance of accidental war higher than now. Uh, that is due to uh, the several, several factors. Of course, these uh, shift, sudden shifts and very fast shifts, unheard of in history. Of the, of the correlation of forces, uh, which I have mentioned before, are part of that situation. But in addition to that, we have uh, new generations of weapons, uh, and uh, Americans have them and they want to deploy them, Russians have them, Chinese have them. We have cyber weapons, which we do not know w what they are. And it is highly likely that they are reaching the level of becoming strategic weapons that is ab able either to destruct societies. And uh, they are the easiest target for, I mean, uh, terrorist groups to, uh, to acquire and to, to uh, provoke uh, destruction of big societies. In addition uh, to that, um, uh, we have, of course, the proliferation of nuclear weapons. I mean, we know the history. Now, uh, Korea, uh, uh, we allowed, willingly or unwillingly, uh, the proliferation to India, Pakistan, Israel. Uh, but now they are more or less seen as more or less established, but things are continuing. Uh, of course, after attacks on Libya and Iraq, uh, it was absolutely impossible to expect that uh, North Koreans would reject their, their nuclear uh, program. Uh, the question is now, uh, open, and I was give 50 to 50 whether South Korea and, and Japan uh, will become nuclear. Uh, and taking into consideration the collapse of the, or, or the simmering collapse of the Iran nuclear deal, uh, because Americans want to re, uh, renegotiate that, and uh, it is highly likely that under pressure Iran will have, no, will have uh, no other way but to go nuclear. And then we have, of course, obvious uh, candidates. Uh, that is becoming the new reality for the new world. Uh, in addition uh, to that, we have uh, uh, a collapse of uh, 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 all uh, uh, regimes of controlling uh, weapons of mass destruction. I mean, or, or near collapse, we're not yet there. And there are very, uh, there are very, very little uh, serious conversations between major powers, I will come. Uh, to the more positive uh, part of my uh, of my uh, speech a bit later uh, on that, uh, uh, and the two major major powers, that is United States and Russia, look at each other either with hatred or with disdain, uh, which is, by the way, a very uh, bad political background. N even in I would say in Soviet America, I mean so in communist times. Uh, communist capitalist times, uh, there was respect. And there is no respect, there's hatred and disdain. Uh, so where things will be going from here, and I'm coming to the end of my uh, formal uh, presentation. Uh, very likely uh, that the world is moving over this period of multipolarity, which we all wanted. I mean, Indians prayed for it, Russians prayed for it, Chinese prayed for it. We are, we are there. But it's chaos, and chaos prone with a very serious danger of a major war. Uh, so uh, I think we have to work on overcoming um, uh, this period with an understanding where to go. 
the most likely scenario is uh, formation of two centers of power, uh, our centers of influence. Uh, one around the United States, which, is, which are temporary, uh, which are semi-withdrawing, trying to strengthen themselves. They are ceasing to be a global power and becoming a pull, which uh, used to be in during the Cold War again. Uh, with a group of countries around them, uh, most probably China will be another center of another pool, uh, and uh, uh, which uh, will, in, as I said, in 15 years will be technologically equal or superior because the investment in uh, uh, education and technology is such that they will, uh, they are doomed to, to be uh, the first class technological power, they are doomed to be first class military power. Uh, so uh, that is why we are, uh, we Russians are, together with our Chinese friends, are pushing the, forward the idea of Greater Eurasia. That is a web of relationship which is aimed at, or, and a concept of looking at the world, which is aimed at three things. One is to create a peaceful, uh, coexistent system within, the greater, within our great continent, including Europe, eventually. The second or sub-aim sub is to overcome uh, the uh, confrontation in Europe, which is, has been returned, which was not healed, uh, but it could, would, could not be sold on Russia-European uh, ways. Uh, the third uh, is, of course, a balancing of China. Uh, China uh, is a, uh, uh, in spite of uh, the things which I re read in your press, is a relatively peaceful power, but it's becoming really too strong for its neighbors. Uh, if China chooses, and it's highly likely that it will choose, uh, to become the number one among equals, to become a part of the, uh, 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 of the greater Eurasia type of think through regional comprehensive economic partnership which we are negotiating with them together with ASEAN countries through strengthening of CSO but also to un through understanding that uh, that uh, it's merging in this whatever relationship is in the interests of China uh, very much like uh, 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 Germany after the unifications knowingly merged itself with, within the European Union and it was probably the greatest achievement of uh, Chancellor Kohl apart from uh, negotiating the unification of Germany that he merged himself Germany uh, which was uh, which is not now feared was still most powerful country in Europe which is not feared and it was feared I remember I mean, 25, uh, 27 years ago, when I was uh, asked uh, to give a uh, the, uh, to give a hearing at uh, uh, the British Parliament, and I was adamantly uh, attacked for being uh, for uh, me, a Russian, uh, being irresponsible for allowing allowing Germany to unite. And it was, I have never heard such. Uh, I, I was a hostility in my life, although I uh, could travel, I lived through a Cold War, and I was, uh, that was, I mean, the situation then, and that is the situation now. Uh, so, but it is, of course, uh, it should be done together with others, and of course India uh, is a key player, whether it chooses to have a continental strategy, or it chooses to, well, it's, I'm not, I'm not a, man from imperial power. So uh, you all have the choice, but I think it was, uh, if I were in India, I would have chosen to be a, a key player, a continental player, uh, uh, rather than a, a force which is deterring uh, one or two players um, uh, on the same continent. Uh, in addition to that, uh, which is what is needed even more, it's a long-term process, and I think that we will arrive at that maybe in 15, 20 years if we arrive, t no, 10, 15 years if we arrive at these two poles, which are, of course, it's still interdependent, still cooperate with each other. Uh, and in the, by the way, in this poll, I do not see, unfortunately, and I am a European, the place of Europe, uh, because uh, the Europe has lost its zest, so the loss of energy, and it, uh, it looks that Europe will become um, not a pole, but a, uh, an, uh, an end game an, uh, or uh, a source of uh, competition uh, between, I mean, it is already becoming between Eurasians and, and Atlanticists. Uh, I hope that 
will manage that problem somehow. I, I do not see Europeans are ready to go to war. I mean, there are some in Eurasia which are still there. Uh, and it will be a different but a much more peaceful order. In order to arrive there, we have to start serious conversations uh, uh, on strategic matters. They are absolutely absent from uh, uh, strategic horizon. I've said that we've never, uh, since uh, the late 60s, we have uh, never had, s we Russians have never had uh, such a uh, ugly and uh, uh, relations with the United States with virtually no serious conversations on most strategic matter. But China is not having them. Too. India is having through all kind of ways. By the way, uh, so the best way would be, of course, to start serious conversations between Russia, China, uh, India, United States, of course, eventually when they overcome this zest of theirs. Uh, of how to enhance strategic, I mean, international strategic stability. Not strategic stability only based on nuclear or, or arsenals, uh, uh, but uh, taking into consideration all factors which are affecting all most factors, including cyber stability, including new conventional weapons, and including political relationship. Because we could not uh, 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 afford uh, to live in the world where there is no serious uh, negotiations between major powers. This new relationship, I think, should be based on different principles, on the strategic relationship. Uh, for over, uh, for during the last several decades, our Russian-American relationship was based uh, on uh, a desire to overcome deterrence. Americans wanted to overcome deterrence by two means. One, doing away with nuclear weapons, when uh, that will make the world safe for American economic and military predominance. We understood that, so we were not eager. Um, uh, and then another way was, of course, and of course a lot, a lot of very liberal-sounding friends wanted to uh, do away with uh, 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 nuclear deterrence. But we have to understand that uh, mutual nuclear deterrence of major powers, including India, maybe future powers, uh, is the only stabilizing force for this very long period of instability, which we are facing, and a building of new uh, systems uh, of uh, uh, world governors. Uh, if we do that, well, then uh, uh, giving a when my successor will be giving a lecture here uh, uh, 20 years from now, would be saying, well, now we are living at, not at the destruction, but the period of construction. And I'm an optimist. Uh, Russian um, should be, with our history, should be an optimist. Either we, in a, conf in a confrontation, we always win, and we survive uh, through so many unbelievable deep crises that you couldn't uh, be anything but an optimist. Uh, with, and I assume that Indians, knowing your history, though perfunctory, should be optimists too. All the more, I mean, uh, it is in your religion even more than, uh, and in your culture even more than in ours. So I hope we will uh, go with these conversations for decades more, and we're living in a much more comfortable world. But this world is in our hands, how we will do that. Uh, we are present at the creation, very much like in 45, 55. Um, we have to be uh, up to the challenge. Thank you. Sorry, Raut. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you'll all agree with me that this has been a fascinating tour de force um, looking at the world around us. I like the way you ended, Sergey, when you say that um, Russians are optimists and so are Indians. And you're optimists because you never lost a war. Uh, we are optimists because we have never fought a war. Uh, <laughs> I mean, major war <laughs> of the kind you fought. <coughs> But I would imagine you would also agree that the Chinese are optimists. Uh, they imagine the world is theirs. Uh, but don't forget the Americans are optimists too, because they think technology is still on their side. 
Um, and I entirely agree with you that in this world of uh, four optimistic major powers, the Europeans are pessimists. The, the Europeans have virtually given up. Um, and uh, whatever hope we had in uh, research in Germany, and we in India, uh, I, I would certainly want a research in Germany and a research in Japan, but neither is happening at a pace that one would like. But I guess um, if Germany uh, and Japan were to once again rise, uh, then uh, they, have, they would remain forced to reckon with. So I was wondering whether you had any thoughts, Juan, on the Far East, uh, particularly what's happening in South China Sea, Japan, China, and a potential Korean unification um, in case the second phase of sunshine continues. The point you make about uh, India being more uh, con maritime in its thinking and not adequately continental, I'm sure I have my friends here uh, who have written on this uh, issue and they will have questions for you. Um, but given the fact that uh, we are boxed in um, to the north, uh, at the moment we have no option but to think uh, maritime. But historically, we have been continental. Um, historically, our reach has been all the way to St. Petersburg in the west and to Vietnam in the east in terms of people-to-people of, of, uh, -people links. Um, you did not mention uh, anywhere um, in your presentation what kind of preoccupies our mind a lot. And if you spent one evening in Delhi and watched our television, you would know what that is, which is Pakistan. And um, Russia uh, and Pakistan relations, something that I'm sure many in the audience would want you to say a little more about. But my final uh, remark is, while I, while I uh, agree with your op sense of optimism about um, the role of uh, Russia, China, and potentially India, um, India is not yet part of the existing systems of governance. So where do you see Russia in terms of restructuring, say, the United Nations, restructuring existing systems of uh, governance? and? How does Russia view India in, 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 in that sense? I mean, we know the official statements, but I'm talking of you as a scholar. And finally, um, you spoke about um, Russia is willing to accept China as one number one among equals. Uh, my own view is India is not yet ready to accept China as a number one. Uh, among equals. India would, this, this constellation you talk about, United States, Russia, China, India, I think um, either, uh, either it has to be a constellation of equals or it will be a constellation of unequal, inequal, unequals. How do you ensure a stability in a constellation which one country regards itself as number one among equals. After all, that was a problem with the unipolar world. All of you, all of us were not willing to accept the United States as number one. Why should we accept China as number one? But with those initial questions, and I'll leave it to you to respond, I will invite uh, questions and comments. I know there are a lot of scholars in our audience today. It's a very distinguished audience. I must tell you, uh, we, are, we are flattering you with the quality of our audience. Uh, and, uh, you know, because I, I can't individually introduce you to many here, but I recognize lots of faces around the hall of uh, people who have spent a lifetime thinking about some of these issues. Uh, so I don't know if you'd like to react to what I've just asked, and then we move on. Uh, uh, thank you very much, I would. Uh, uh, many of the uh, questions that you have asked are simply open. I mean, we are living in a, at a time of construction. Uh, so it is uh, upon our to decide, but I will, whether Germany will and Japan will act as uh, great powers again, Japan could. I'm not sure whether Germany, although uh, Germany will be a powerful and very important country in Europe, uh, but I'm not sure whether it could uh, resurrect itself to uh, its previous positions. I mean, too harsh a history. And I think that most countries in Europe 
uh, uh, except for, I think, our country, my country, uh, walking with the, uh, broken spines, which is bad, which is good, because Europe, when it was in uh, broken spines, was the most dangerous place in the world. I mean, uh, two world wars in one generation emanating from Europe, and we all suffered, and you suffered, whether you were, whether you, though you were very far away, I mean. Uh, in that situation, uh, but uh, still, these were very will be very important powers. To I would say that if I will see a future concert of powers, uh, it will be Russia, United States, China, India, Japan, and maybe Germany if they are able, uh, and probably then Indonesia and Iran later on, uh, if they are able to solve their problem, which is. Uh, a part of their solution, and that is they merged, they, uh, the European Union was uh, created this system of common foreign and security policy, uh, which uh, made it peaceful power. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not, it doesn't fit in the new competitive world, but they couldn't overcome that. And uh, for that, they have to co go back uh, to a coordinated that rather than common foreign po and defense policy. Whether that is a, uh, they're able to do that, I do not know. And the European Union could not play the role of a sovereign power. And the world probably, maybe to my regret, will be a world of big sovereign states rather than of uh, great international entities. I must, I am saying that with great, really with great regret, because European Union, uh, um, even would have, the world would have, uh, go, uh, would have gone the European way. It would have been the uh, shining example of how the world uh, should develop. But, uh, but unfortunately for European uh, uh, experiment, the world is moving in a different direction. Uh, uh, Russia, well, I didn't speak about uh, Russian failures. We have, have had a few. I mean, underestimation of the situation in the near, near abroad, uh, the uh, fact that uh, idealistically we believed in words in the 90s, and we you know, did away with many of our uh, trump cards, uh, thinking that we will be thanked for that. We were not. Uh, and of course, one of the minor but serious mistakes have been the underestimation of the role in India, of India in Russian uh, foreign policy, uh, because uh, there was a collapse since Soviet times, and then we have not filled the gap. And I think it's both of, both of us who have to fill the gap, both economically, politically, strategically, intellectually. That is one of the most urgent tasks, uh, I think, uh, that should be on the Russian um, uh, foreign uh, policy agenda. Uh, well, may, maybe we could be excused uh, for this failure because it looks like Russian-Indian uh, relations are very good on the surface, but they are very, uh, they are very thin, and that is uh, uh, that does not correspond to the challenges of the new Greater Eurasia, the world, uh, or uh, Russian. Whether uh, UN uh, uh, UN Security Council could be expanded. Uh, my uh, my own attitude, yes. The problem is that uh, whom and how. India is clearly should be there, but then of course others will push two or three others, and you open up a Pandora box, whereas we ruin even the, uh, what is the rest of the world governance system. The UN Security Council is with all is a not a fair organization, of course, and it's outdated, uh, but it's the only a remnant of the order which uh, is surviving. That's why, I mean, India, yes, but how to do this is a big question. And I think, uh, you know, even the official position is close to what I am saying, uh, because you open up and then, then Japan wants and then Germany wants and if Germany, the European Union will end here, you end, uh, then, and, uh, and you open up and you open up. We were very close about, I think, 10 years ago, um, to the to the solution of this issue, now we have to do it probably because the overwhelming instability in the world, which is uh, could be even more dangerous than equanimity. And then about equals. Uh, first of all, I believe that no, nobody could be equal to Russians. And with this attitude, I mean, whether somebody is stronger than you economically, it doesn't matter. 
I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of the lens, of, of, of the lens at which you uh, um, look at the world. I mean, I'm criticizing uh, constantly, I have been criticizing constantly uh, my uh, um, friends in Russia uh, for being, uh, uh, for calling for equal relations with the United States. How come, I mean? I mean, this country, I mean, of course it's a great uh, country and, uh, and a gorgeous democracy and a powerful country, but how could we possibly be equal, or uh, want to be equal? We want to uh, have a constructive, uh, beneficial interest, uh, relations based on interest with the United States and with China. Whether China is number one or number two does not matter. For you, it is a much more deeper question because we have no, I think you have also, maybe I'm wrong, a, a cultural dimension to your rivalry. We do not have a cultural dimension to our rivalry with China. Uh, so, yes, okay, so China would be, uh, they were, would be stronger. Uh, but uh, if uh, by being stronger and more affluent, uh, they will be, uh, will be not aggressive and there are no signs uh, that they would be aggressive. Of course, everybody is afraid of China becoming uh, aggressive eventually when it becomes uh, uh, too strong. Uh, but uh, culture, uh, but by the, by the way, Chinese culture is a bit different from European culture. Uh, I mean, even uh, geopolitical culture is different. So the question is again, how you, how you manage that? Yeah. Well, I'll have one more question before I open up, which is uh, provoked by what you just said. Um, how you look at the yourself. Um, you say as a Russian, I think I'm number one. But there is also the view of Russia as, you know, some people uh, said tauntingly that Russia is Saudi Arabia with nukes. Uh, or the, it's Ra Saudi Arabia with an educated people. In other words, your s economic strength is in your energy, oil, and nothing more. Um, is that a, first of all, um, what is the new source of Russia's power? Well, I'm constantly, thank you, I'm constantly criticizing my government and my elite uh, for not paying t uh, enough attention uh, to economic development. And it's uh, absolutely open. I mean, we are too afraid of a new revolution. Uh, but uh, again, it's a different, uh, I have a different view. I mean, you said, well, first of all, uh, we are, our, uh, our dependence on oil is declining. Uh, four years ago, it was 60% of our uh, budget. Now it's 38, and it is going down because other industries are growing. But still, we shall be dependent. Now, but let me give, uh, of course, I mean, our competitors or uh, countries or people who do not like us, and there are many, because we are, I mean, arrogant, strong. Uh, we are there, and, and huge. I mean, and huge. Uh, we are there. I mean, they are saying, well, I mean, uh, it's, uh, uh, and we have the Kremlin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but uh, I look at that with that. Yes, we have a relatively weak economy, which is, which is a shame. Uh, but uh, we have first-class military. Uh, I mean, and nuclear. I mean, competitive advantage. And the world is moving uh, to the basics again, where com this competitive advantage works. Now we have a highly educated population. Competitive advantage. We have a first, I mean, the, the best in the world diplomacy. And uh, so, competitive advantage. So, I mean, uh, and uh, I look at my country uh, as a comprehensive power. So, yes, we have weaknesses, but we have strengths. And uh, we look at the Chinese. Oh, yes, they are economically very enormous and growing, but I mean, strategically, and uh, they are not yet in the league. So, it is, again, uh, it is a way of uh, looking. We are now, of course, in the time of the ardent competition and rivalry. As I've said, I mean, 98% of the news which are emanating from the Western world are bi biased or worse. Uh, but uh, we are assessing uh, uh, our strengths and our weaknesses uh, with our m own uh, capacity and with our own mind. Well, I think that's the most important message for an Indian audience, what you just said. The world is returning to basics. And competitive advantage is going to be defined by basics. I think that's an extremely powerful statement. Basics would be 
an educated people, a competitive economy, a and military. hard military yeah, power, yeah. nuclear <coughs> capability. I mean, I agree with you. I see already my friend uh, Raja Mohan and uh, Manoj Joshi and uh, Mr. Kanoria. I'll invite them in that order and then go around. The mic is in front of you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Mr. Sarganov, for that uh, very uh, interesting presentation. So I had just uh, one question now, which is, uh, in your presentation, uh, you seem to, you know, constantly refer to the West. Uh, is the West really a united entity today? Uh, that uh, if you look at the U.S., uh, you would think uh, everybody hates, seems to hate Trump, uh, and Trump seems to love Russia. Now, this idea that that while you framing as if it is a coherent monolithic block, the West, uh, while actually the divisions are so deep internally within each of the Western countries as well as between them. Uh, what I find interesting is that China seems better equipped, better prepared to exploit the inter-imperialist contradictions, to use the old term, than Russia, which is framing the, the contradiction essentially between East and West or between you know, West and uh, East. So, so the problem for us is, as we look at uh, Russia that is changing, if it is about balance of power, uh, we might have a common way of dealing with the problem. But if it is merely about putting America down or West down, then I think then I think our trajectories might might actually evolve in a different direction. But I would think we have a common ground in finding a stable balance of power in the Eurasian landmass. Whether you call it continental or maritime, it does not really matter. We need a balance in Eurasia because that's quite central to because all our sources of threat for us come from the continental side, while our opportunities, as Sanjay said, is more maritime. But we want a balance of power system in Eurasia. And are we on the same side? I mean, I think that is the, that is the question. Because if we don't see the Chinese power as a problem, which Indian, most Indians today are seeing, then I think our answers are different. And then the problem becomes, how do we manage the difference? But if we agree on balance of power, then that at least keeps open the possibility of structuring some strategic uh, balancing arrangement between India and Russia. Uh, thank you for the question. Of course, I mean, you're right that I did not, I, I was, um, I didn't mention uh, uh, the fact that the West is different. And I completely agree. Uh, and uh, in our calculation of the new Cold War, my, calcul my calculation, is that there will be no West against, there will be a Russia uh, versus the United States for a while. Uh, but Russia-China versus the United States, which is, I mean, I mean, make my day. I mean, this is a, if you want to fight like that. Uh, uh, but the West is different, of course, and it's going in all kinds of directions, and it is uh, less united. I didn't mention that because uh, Russia is habitually uh, condemned by trying to uh, uh, to put wedges into Western uh, unity. Uh, but, uh, I mean, the unity is... Um, uh, dissolving by its own. Uh, so it's, uh, w uh, we believe that eventually, first of all, we would have to have good relations with the United States. And eventually we would have them. I mean, when they overcome their internal problems, uh, hopefully, and if we do not deteriorate into a war in, in between, which, is, uh, which will end up the history of humanity. Will end, uh, 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 as to the European, Europe, uh, it, it was, will be drifting in all kinds of directions, probably over these decades. It will be still a wealth of uh, economic power, a wealth of history, of culture. And we are very much part of Europe, I mean, in spite of the fact that Russians now are seeing themselves as, not as uh, fringe Europeans, but a great Eurasians. We are still, I mean, culturally and united to Europe. So, and the great Eurasia concept, is aimed also into bringing in Europe into a new constellation. Uh, uh, after all, I mean, uh, uh, the Silk Road uh, was, uh, the term, term Silk Road was uh, created by, uh, forged by uh, von Richthofen. I mean, they were part of us. I mean, then the, uh, so they will be part of us. And uh, the question is how, again, uh, to view that. Um, uh, eventually, I think uh, there will be a period of competition for Europe, uh, but hopefully it will be peaceful competition, which will not deteriorate into structural military confrontation as during the previous Cold War. 
uh, and uh, then I foresee um, good relations with uh, Europe, in spite of the fact that now we have a difference, real, a real difference for, for the time being, the real difference uh, in value systems. Uh, Russians are traditional Europeans. I mean, Europeans are post-Europeans. Uh, but I think that uh, the realities will uh, push um, uh, Europeans towards more, more realism, while Russians towards uh, being uh, more liberalism, eventually, if we survive. And the American is in the uh, United States is in a period of very rapid transformation. And I think that we have to wait for that. And I'm, I assume uh, that, uh, by the way, that if you look at the West now, the cultural divide between uh, uh, United States and Europe uh, is much deeper than before. Uh, but whether uh, where United States will go, we do not know whether it will go European way uh, towards more uh, tolerance, less uh, religion, etc., or whether it will go American way. We do not know. We shall see uh, how things will uh, develop. Uh, there, uh, Russia uh, in, uh, sees itself in the new world as the main supplier of uh, security. We stopped NATO expansion, preventing a big war in Europe. We do that now in the Middle East. Um, we could we deterring others, big powers, uh, and uh, it is very simple. Let history work. We do not know the outcome, but it, uh, but it is clear that we are not anti-Western. I mean, for the time being, uh, Cold War is being imposed on us. So we say, come on, I mean, we didn't want it. Uh, but we shall fight and win, as we always have won. Well, there was a period when we, there were some, there were some battle, battles which Russia lost. Uh, but they were rare, and not this time. I'll come back to you, Manoj. So, Professor Karkonov, that's been very, very interesting. So I have the advantage of being one of the oligarchs and not one of the scholars. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> frankly speaking, I would be allowed to make any naive remarks and something which I probably don't understand. But nevertheless, some, you know, this is a very thought-provoking address. And for me, it raises plenty of questions. The first thing you talked about, I mean, in your summary, you said that we're a world under construction. My question which comes to my mind is who is constructing it? And I think it's very important if you look at it from that point of view that there are democracies in the US and Europe and uh, including in India where economic power and political power are not necessarily aligned. And that I think is one of the major factors which where China has a huge advantage where business economy and politics are totally aligned. So when we talk about this one belt, one road initiative or you know the reconstruction of the Silk Route, it has both uh, maritime or military connotations and of course I mean it, in the garb of trade, I think there is a huge strategic uh, structure which is being built by uh, China and if we look at our own neighborhood, whether we look at Sri Lanka where we talk about Haman Tota, we talk about Pakistan, where huge amount of infrastructure is going in at terms which these countries can certainly not ever repay. So what will be the ultimate outcome of that? That's one aspect which comes. The second, we have not talked about the influence of technology in the world. So we have these, the Googles, the Apples uh, of the world and uh, the Facebooks, Microsoft and on the other side in China we have equally powerful companies coming up which are Baidu, Tencent and Alibaba's which are platform organizations and they have they are going to accumulate huge amounts of data. Now there is already talk in the West uh, that how do we tame these companies. So just like in the olden days standard oil was broken up into 34 pieces, what will really happen to a Google or what will happen to these companies? Will they be allowed to function as single entities? Will they be become so powerful? But on the other hand, the Chinese companies don't have that disadvantage of any regulatory framework affecting their businesses. So this control on data, what impact will it have 
in the world economic order. I mean, these are, there are so many questions. I mean, I can go on about uh, tons of these ideas and questions which are coming to my mind. And the third point also which I have is that energy itself is no longer one of the strategic advantages. I mean, we talk about oil, but with, uh, with uh, uh, you know, with shale in the US or we're looking at alternative energies and the development of new sources of energy, uh, renewables, uh, will, I mean, this whole Russia and the Middle East, this, it, it becomes a different ball game. I mean, up to now, the U.S. interest in the Middle East has been primarily to make and secure themselves on the energy economy. Will that be any more important? And if not, then will it completely change and radicalize the manner in which uh, we look at uh, you will not. I mean, I don't know. I can raise many other questions. <coughs> well, thank you. I mean, these are the, the deepest questions one could possibly pose. I mean, uh, and there's no answer for them, clear answer. But uh, we could rely on some history. First of all, there were predictions about technological revolutions all in Dover. Uh, they influenced them. But this technological revolution, I mean, uh, which is very important, which is happening there, cyber revolution, whatever you call it, uh, wouldn't, I, I think is not changing the world, it's changing the world that is run. Uh, cyber does not produce food. Cyber does not produce uh, transportation. Cyber helps. And I'm not sure whether we are yet on the verge of the real new technological transportation. For example, that will be, of course, uh, uh, transportation or else. We are not there. Uh, second, we don't know where it goes. Uh, um, uh, third, uh, and we, uh, just a very simple example, 15, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, we are uh, calling on our American friends uh, to start negotiating the cyber security. They adamantly rejected that because they thought that it would keep advantage there. Now they feel themselves threatened by Google's and Apple's Oh, and uh, they are trying to take control uh, over that field. Uh, that's how, how it will happen. Uh, the more deeper question is the competition which you have mentioned between the so-called democratic powers and the so-called authoritarian powers. Uh, in an open competition, uh, he wins who wins. Uh, and uh, democracy uh, in this particular world, not exactly in the Indian world, uh, have been uh, created on the basis of overall military superiority and, uh, uh, and ability uh, to attract GNP from all over the world. And I'm not sure whether these democracies will survive. I'm, I'm, by the way, I want Russia to be more democratic. I, th I think we have a, uh, a lack of democracy in our country, and it is uh, containing our effectiveness to a certain extent. Uh, but uh, I'm not... Uh, I, I do not believe in the end of history. And let me remind ourselves uh, that democracy was here in the Greek republics, then waned. Uh, it was in Rome, then went away. It was in, Ven in my beloved Venice, uh, then it again was lost. So the question is not democracy or not democracy, is uh, the way of governance. Democracy is one of the way of governing societies. Uh, and it is up for the societies uh, to uh, determine the most effective ways. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure, and it is happening already, uh, that um, the democratic countries um, of the West will be, become more authoritarian. Absolutely. And the fact that Americans are trying to take control uh, on over, over social media is one and, Amer and others. Uh, 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 is uh, the, the obvious example. They saw that this system does not work in the open society, in the open world. For, it's up for you to, to decide. Uh, but of course, uh, if I calculate, I mean, a, a Cold War uh, confrontation with the United States, being authoritarian and uh, having a modern technological system is an advantage. Well, it's up for you to decide. It's again, it is, it is culture. And by the way, uh, if you want to retain 
uh, a thing which is very dear to your culture, you could, by the way, sacrifice effectiveness. Uh, for example, now in Russia, one of the reasons why we are uh, stuck uh, in, uh, in a relative economic stagnation is that we are afraid of, again, going back uh, to the turmoil of the 20th century, which brought the country near twice in the history near, uh, I mean, down to near collapse in 1917-21 and in 1991. So it's, it's, it's for you, for every society to decide. But we believe that the world which is coming will give us a, a, a possibility to decide for ourselves, rather than to listen to others or to being uh, coerced by others as uh, in the uh, previous uh, world. As to energy, yes, the United States is less dependent on the uh, Middle East, that's why it's partially withdrawing also because it's too expensive. But uh, the question, uh, but uh, the idea that renewables will be uh, here and that they will push out oil and even coal, and the Indians are, by the way, going uh, to Russia to um, now to, uh, to invest in mining coal uh, in, the, uh, in Kamchatka and elsewhere, I think is a myth. Of course, their share of renewables will be bigger, and that is good for, for, for all of us. Uh, but the energy consumption would be growing so fast that there will be that the pie would be I mean much water, uh, vaster. Uh, so I think there will be more. T uh, uh, eventually, historically, it will be more demand for energy for all kinds of energy. And let me remind you that mining of bitcoins, which is the strange. I mean, endeavor very popular here, as you know, and my, in my country too. Uh, some of the, these miners, I mean, consume more energy than uh, aluminum plants, and uh, we all know that again. That uh, even keeping the data or storing the data, uh, and uh, uh, this data uh, uh, is uh, taking much more. I mean, these uh, storage facilities taking much more power. Uh, then uh, aluminum again, aluminum melting plants, which are proverbial in terms of consuming uh, power. Uh, well, by the way, when we when we were uh, thinking about how uh, and advantages of turning Russia to the east, and Russia is very rapidly moving to the east. This year, our trade with uh, with Asia is more, uh, or Eurasian Economic Union is more than with Europe. Uh, we thought about one competitive advantage. Well, there were several, but one was cold. And in our papers, we said, I mean, Russia could build uh, a data storage, big data storage facilities. The first has been erected. And it consumes four times more, four times less energy per uh, gigabyte than in Shanghai and, uh, and probably in India because of the cold. So it's a new, wor new world. It's, but you never know where it, it goes. Manoj. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention uh, to uh, India-Russia relations. Uh, this is one of the, uh, what should I say, unfulfilled uh, potential of the India-Russia relationship. And why I'm saying this is that I draw your attention to the fact that almost a decade before the One Belt, One Road was announced, uh, India, Russia, and Iran had decided on the International North-South Transportation Corridor uh, scheme which was a grand continental uh, strategy, uh, which would have benefited all three countries. Uh, now, I know that you know, we have had one or two test cargoes going through. But beyond that, nothing seems to be happening. And uh, in part, it has to do with the very weak India-Russia economic relationship. Do you think that this international north-south transportation corridor uh, still offers uh, a kind of a riposte to the one belt, one road uh, which goes east-west, and this one goes uh, north-south. Uh, well, uh, that is, you're uh, repeating exactly our, uh, my and our, our arguments uh, that uh, one of our weaknesses of uh, Russian uh, geoeconomic situation is that we have uh, very little connections uh, to the south. And by the way, from north to the south, because actually uh, we have no transportation, I mean, fixed transportation routes to the um, uh, Arctic Ocean, which, uh, which are also, uh, which will be needed sooner or later. Uh, 
Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, we have to do that. And thanks God after that, after 20 years of, 25 years, and after 50, 10 years of another pro procrastination, we have started to build this road. Uh, but it is only one episode. But also we have to understand that um, in this new world, it's not only transportation which matters. We have to have the north-south. There is no question about that. Uh, both going through China, by the way, and Mongolia, uh, virtually to, uh, to ASEAN countries and maybe then to India. And then, of course, through Iran, Iran, Azerbaijan, Persian Gulf, and to India. Uh, but that is, uh, that is uh, for, for the future, and that is, could be one of the projects for a future Russian um, Indian uh, cooperation. We have uh, wasted times uh, uh, on that. I completely agree with that. Uh, but it's not a gun opportunity. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, again, if you calculate our future, uh, we, we shall see that there are a lot of uh, other possibilities. Uh, uh, building up relationship, economic and political, and other relationship with India. The problem is again, uh, we had had this Soviet Indian, then sudden collapse, and then uh, a feeling that everything is fine. And then, of course, the uh, the magnetism of Europe first and China now. Uh, but it is it was a mistake on Russian side, which will be corrected, hopefully, with the help of Indian friends. We are not only we. Indians and Russians need that. I mean, uh, the, the continent and the world needs that, because uh, otherwise it is one of the ways, by the way, to balance uh, the omnipotence of China, of which are so much afraid. Absolutely, which is why you're here this afternoon. The fact that connectivity is key. I mean, if you look at Indian foreign policy statements and our own strategy towards East Asia, etc., we've been talking in the last few years about connectivity, building connectivity, and most recently, we had the visit of the Iranian president we talking about connectivity through Iran to Central Asia. And you are talking of a railway line from Moscow down uh, to Persian Gulf. Um, and once this connectivity is restored, then a lot of the old economic relationships which we had would be restored. And I think you're, it's refreshing to hear from you, Sergei, when you say, that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you flirted with uh, Europe, and then you're flirting now with China, and finally you settle down and marry India. Yeah, but, <laughs> but by the way, things are not that bad. <laughs> because uh, now with Katerina's um, uh, television, we, uh, we have a special station, uh, which is called Bollywood. So things are not uh, that bad. Okay. I mean, the, the cultural relationships are there. Okay. Uh, so we are, we are restoring them. Good. Dinesh, <laughs> Dinesh, <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Dinesh Vedi, a member of parliament. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Baru and Fiki for giving this excellent opportunity because we hardly get scholars from Russia. So it's a great uh, opportunity for us. Having said that, I think the most powerful uh, weapon is knowledge. And India has been a country of knowledge. It still is a country of knowledge. And in foreseeable future, I still see India a country of knowledge. Now, as you rightly said, that world is really into changing pattern. And I do believe that too. The multilateral institutions are almost becoming, if not irrelevant, less important be it United Nations, World Bank, IMF. So the world is really getting redesigned. And that redesigning is done perhaps at a place like Silicon Valley, but by Indians. So whether you see Microsoft, whether you see uh, Google, whether you see HCL, whether you see Pepsi, these are all headed by Indians. So India has a great contribution in terms of knowledge and this century is of knowledge century and that is one of the reasons uh, when we are talking about being number one number two number four in the world india i don't think so has ever been in that competition because we never felt insecure and we always felt that everything is knowledge now having said that my specific uh, question is on cyber security 
and I, 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 I'm not an expert in, in this field, but I have recommended this government to have a ministry dedicated only to cybersecurity. Uh, it's going to impact not only the physical presence, but economy as well. So what are your views? You did touch upon the cybersecurity area. So what are your views? How safe or unsafe this world is in terms of cyber security related to economics? And uh, secondly, uh, what do you think about the future of currency? Whether we are going to get into digital currency, uh, the currency at the moment what we are used to is going to be obsolete. And what do you think about the cryptocurrency? Mm -hmm. Because the banks and all could be a thing of the past. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, very complicated and uh, deep questions. Well, well, first of all, in Silicon Valley, uh, uh, there is a second language, which is Russian. I mean, because uh, uh, the Indians there speak English. Uh, yes, I mean, so um, fortunately, unfortunately, we also have uh, uh, yes, contributed uh, very much to this digital revolution. Uh, and we, and I think the third expert after Russia now, after uh, weapons, and now grain, uh, no, fourth, uh, uh, oil, gas, weapons, and grain is uh, software. So we are a major software power, by the way, you know, where we probably compete with the uh, or I don't know. I mean, I have not heard about that. But anyway, uh, it is clear that the knowledge is everywhere, but the problem is that we do not know how to use it. And, uh, and our think tank communities are in disarray uh, because of this flow of information, I mean, kicks the minds off. I mean, the question now is how to understand that. And uh, their supercomputers wouldn't help us most probably. So we have to rely uh, on ourselves more and think together. And neither Indians nor Russians nor Americans alone could not deal with this question. And then I'm going back. As I've said, we are in a in the midst of the mental revolution. We could not understand the world because we have too many. And that's why, for example, I suppose uh, I'm also a dean among my, my, my many professions, and I'm telling students, do not read internet, other than for for reason for uh, studying. And we are forbidding, like Americans are forbidding, the use of um, uh, uh, of, the, of uh, iPhones and iPads in the classes, because it ta it it uh, it brings the duration of your mind, uh, eventually. So it, it is a huge problem. Uh, but uh, so knowledge is not, in the old sense, is not the key. The uh, the key is understanding, and uh, how to and the uh, and uh, the key is to educate our elites. And I am I am pretty sure that one of the competitive advantage of uh, uh, of the of my country is uh, that I'm pretty sure he does read the internet. <laughs> he does have a, he has a lot of time. I mean, for, for other things and thinking about thinking strategically. Uh, so the other leaders of my country read the internet. So about cybersecurity, uh, as I've said, it's an, uh, we are uh, in an absolute unknown world, and we do not know uh, that world as of yet. And we are not having serious uh, work, work uh, serious conversations together with you, with Americans, with the Chinese, because everybody is keeping their secrets together. But uh, there is a there's a notion that some countries already in the world have a det full deterrence capacity by only a p possibility of applying cyber weapons. I mean, if it is so, uh, it might be that India and Russia and China and the United States will be in better, but if other would have that, and it will not, they will, you, you will, not, at least you know, in case of uh, North Korea, you know, I mean, more or less, I mean, of course, you couldn't do away with that, but you know what the problem is. I mean, there are nuclear weapons. But if a North Korea of the future world will have cyber weapons uh, the way we have now, the three countries, maybe India too, it will be a very dangerous world. That's why I uh, said that, I mean, our emphasis should be on opening 
a very serious strategic dialogue on strengthening strategic stability in all senses, not only in nuclear, but in cyber, political, uh, uh, etc. Because we are, we have, the, the, I, I'm not sure whether the technological revolution will bring us into a new world, but in security terms, we are already there. And we are not acknowledging that. And that's one of the major dangers and flaws uh, emanating for, from the new Cold War. Because, I mean, instead of, I mean, working together, we are blaming each other uh, and cursing each other. Uh, but, again, we have lived through many dangers, and we have survived. So, uh, let us pray and work together. Yes, ma'am. Ah, yes, the currency. I'm sorry. I'm, I, maybe I'm old-fashioned, but it looks like it, it wouldn't work. Uh, uh, but again, I'm, I'm not a specialist on that. It looks uh, that we, uh, there have been many fads. Uh, you remember, I mean, Nasdaq was believed 20 years ago, was, uh, and the cyber companies were believed that they will reign the world, they will buy, uh, buy all, everything in the world. And then Nasdaq collapsed, and then they, of course, very, uh, 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 very valuable, these companies, but they do not rule the world. And I'm also, my first dissertation was on transnational corporations and uh, United for Foreign Policy. And that time, uh, my friend, people who later became my friends, like Robert Gilpin, like Joseph Nye, read, uh, wrote that in the world of t tomorrow, transnational corporations and uh, and uh, non-governmental organizations and world govern government will rule the world. <laughs> Where are they? <laughs> I mean, I mean, uh, you are representing transnational corporations. Are you ruling the world? Well, I think your position, I mean, vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis your position 10, 15 years ago, is uh, less prominent in spite of in spite of the fact that you are uh, much richer. Uh, because of the global market. Uh, so uh, I, I do not believe in uh, automaticity of technological progress or regress. And uh, it looks like a lot of people will make money on bitcoins, and then things will collapse. But it's my uh, very uneducated assessment. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Kim Jose. I'm a journalist from The Quint. Uh, mm -hmm. You said that uh, the fear mostly is that China will become aggressive. Sorry? You said that the fear about China is mostly that it will become aggressive. That it will become aggressive, China. China will not become. I did I say no, that? No, no. You no, said no. the fear, the people's fear, fear of China, of China ah, yeah, yeah. is that it will become aggressive. Yeah. So how do you then view uh, building activities in the South China Sea? Well, I mean, for you, South China Sea uh, is an important factor. Uh, we have had, I mean, uh, we are living in the midst of a um, crisis and crisis. And for us, it's a small point. And we are first on the, on the agenda, so we don't pay attention, uh, th frankly speaking. And also, w what we know for sure uh, is, of course, the China is pushing uh, its perimeter uh, further from its shores, which uh, any country would do, and eventually India would do, and it's, by the way, trying to do exactly that. What is, I mean, you are talking all the, about this uh, in the Pacific, which is probably a pipe dream, but you want to increase your uh, defense perimeter or your, your stability uh, uh, in the maritime area. Uh, so, uh, and we also know that uh, behind uh, the disputes, it's not only uh, Chinese uh, pressure to uh, increase its defense perimeter, uh, but also American pressure um, uh, to create a line of containment. Uh, so we are looking with uh, that at, with equanimity. We have that. We have had that for years. We know where it goes. Uh, eventually, the China will have a wider perimeter while Americans will adjust, but it will take time, and hopefully that will. Uh, uh, be done peacefully. And I am sure that in this world it will be done peacefully, but it will take time. Yes, sir. 
Uh, Alexander Evans, I'm a British Deputy High Commissioner. Very nice to see you again, and uh, it, it's very good to hear you. I'm struck, but uh, two years ago you were talking about the triumph of conservative realism, but it seems that optimism has been re-injected to the debate, so that's very welcome. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, terrorism, uh, an issue that uh, is of deep concern to India and of deep concern to the Russian Federation as well. And I just in particular wanted to ask you, uh, you didn't mention Afghanistan in your remarks, and I just wondered, uh, given the continuing concerns that both Moscow and Delhi have about the situation in Afghanistan, do you have any comments about what Russia and India can do together to advance uh, your mutual security interests in Afghanistan? Well, the, I, I wrote about conser or the victory of conservative um, realism in a very optimistic way, because the victory of conservative realism is the victory of Russia. I mean, in that particular way. Uh, as to Afghanistan, um, uh, I think that, first of all, I believe that with the historic withdrawal of, of the United States from the area, it will not happen overnight and it will not happen totally, uh, but with the uh, uh, gradually, gradually there, I think that Americans will be, there will be less of Americans in the larger Middle East. Uh, India and Russia would have to come in. Uh, but we are not eager to push Americans out in the meantime because, I mean, with all our difficulties with the United States, they are there and they are keeping uh, some of the problems at bay. Sometimes they have uh, exacerbated that because of the mistakes and incompetence, but still. Uh, but eventually, I mean, in this world of tomorrow, the uh, United States would be a partner, but if I talk to our, you, our Middle Eastern colleagues who are in real panic because I mean the, the whole Middle East is collapsing very rapidly and uh, outer forces, Europe has withdrawn, the United States is withdrawing, Russia is in but uh, they are not sure how they could rely. I would say that um, 15 years from now there will be four powers in the Middle East. Uh, India will be one of them, Russia and China because we have, I mean, the uh, United States is a global power, will keep itself as a global power, it has a lot of connections, uh, but India, Russia and China are dependent on this area. We for security reasons, you for energy reasons, and energy will not go away in spite of the uh, dwindling, uh, uh, somewhat dwindling um, uh, portion of the pie which goes uh, to oil. Uh, but sooner, the, but I hope that uh, these four countries eventually will um, work together, including on the issue of terrorism, which will not go, which will not go away. But we are living uh, through this period of adjustment where, I mean, the animosity prevails, where uh, your terrorists are, uh, are our enemies, or we, oh, I'm sorry, our, our terrorists, your, our, our terrorists are, are your allies or CIA funded troops, uh, fu funded freedom fighters, as they call. And when uh, uh, people who are, c uh, who are supported by the United States are our an uh, enemies in, in reality, however, of course we, are, we should be uh, more or less on one side. Uh, but for that, we have to understand, we have to change some of our other mindsets. Uh, and uh, it will be very hard for Americans, who is still, which uh, Americans are still a revolution in power. I mean, because they they lived out. They are one of the few countries in the world which benefited from the revolution. So you want bring your revolution to other countries. Democracy. Uh, well, democracy in Middle East is bad for your to your health. If we bring stability and development together, that will be a much more uh, thoughtful strategy. I am concerned, of course, a bit uh, about the decline of emphasis in the U.S. military and security strategy on terrorism. Uh, but I hope that eventually, I mean, you, you, you will restore uh, the balance. In the meantime, uh, it is absolutely clear that Russia and India should work very hard together, as well as, by the way, China, in spite of all things. And Chinese are coming, I mean, with their funds and uh, with their, even with their, some of the special troops. Uh, into uh, gradually into Afghanistan, we, it will be the problem which we'll have to work uh, together, but not against, and not against Americans, because either though we could blame Americans for many of the problems there, they are still in this particular part 
uh, a part of, uh, of the world, especially in Afghanistan, a part of solution. Uh, so, but India, and, uh, India is hesitant because of the Pakistani problem, of course. But uh, we are very much willing to, to cooperate, and I think some cooperation has started, if I if I know correctly. Uh, Ambassador Gary Khan, one of our distinguished ambassadors. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Professor Karaganov. I. Uh, I admire the confidence with which you speak, the almost amounting to cock, cockiness, you know. Cockiness. Yeah. Uh, you, you are so cocksure no. of yourself as you speak. I wonder to what extent it is due to the innate strength, the innate strength of Russia or to the assertive, almost aggressive foreign policy of your president, President Putin. He's, uh, he's the one who, who is bringing Russia back to the world stage. Uh, Russia has once again become a major player, but the most important player in, in the Middle East. Uh, and if, not for, if it was not for President Putin, it was somebody else who was less inclined to take such an assertive position in the, on the world stage. I wonder whether the Russians would be just as optimistic as you said about your role and about the future of, of the, the great Russian nation. Uh, but I admired the, the way you, you, you spoke. You said, I, I, you have not said anything whether, about whether you are at all concerned, or if not concerned because you are a big power as you said, which you are. But if uh, uh, somewhat not happy with India getting quite close or very close to the United States, uh, our getting close to the United States suits us, it seems to some extent, is our national interest, so we do that. And in the process, it seems to many of us here that there is certain dist a distance has developed between Russia and China. And we are not as close as we used to be. Uh, I don't know how, what it will take to again establish the kind of relationship that we had between our two countries. If I'm not mistaken, you did mention that the world today is more accident prone. Uh, uh, war is more likely accident prone than it has been for, for decades. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Because one area where I can think this can happen is of course the Middle East where you are and uh, the Americans and other so so many militaries are involved there. We already have uh, body bags going back to Russia, which are people getting killed in in the Middle East. Uh, so can you kind of elaborate a little bit about what, what are the areas in the world where you can where this kind of accidental war can happen? Well, first of all, about uh, whether. It is due to Putin, and I think uh, that Putin is a moderate. I mean, he's constantly under pressure for being more, let's put it aggressive, I mean, more forthcoming, I mean. Uh, he's, uh, well, I think our policy is highly competent, and uh, we uh, use our uh, strengths against our, some uh, the weaknesses, and uh, we play our game around really well, and it's not aggressive, and we do not want a confrontation, that's clear, absolutely. We need some confrontation, of course, with as India needs, because for, I mean, keeping our elite united, but I mean, uh, now we have much more than we need. Uh, and uh, anyway, that's why we uh, opt for better relations with Europe and eventually with the United States, too. Uh, uh, then uh, whether uh, India, U.S. rapprochement will be seen as a danger, no. I mean, it's up to you to decide whether you believe in the uh, in the Pacific strategy, you and we understand that you are balancing. Uh, you are, we understand that you are living in a relatively uneasy situation. You have to grow, with, but I could not even foresee that Indians would become uh, an ally of somebody it's, it's as simple as that. Uh, because you are, have your culture, you have your. I mean, at last you have rediscovered your national identity of a great civilization, power, and how come on, I mean, Indians. Of course, I mean, uh, 
there are a lot of pundits or journalists who are saying that there, that there would be a Russia-U.S. Indian alliance somewhere. No way. I think that to the extent I know uh, and understand India, I mean, you uh, paid for your independence a much higher price than to yield it now. Uh, to somebody else. But, uh, of course, I mean, you have to decide upon your own thinking. I must say that my, my, uh, I would have preferred India to be more of a continental power and playing a more active role in, in, in greater Eurasia. Uh, and I think that uh, that would bring us all a lot of benefits. But you are living in your world. Uh, then, of course, uh, where the accidents, I mean, we don't know. In the in the cyber field, probably, and highly possible. Uh, but there are two areas of the world which are most dangerous now. One is India-Pakistan, and I must say that India-Pakistan is not only dangerous uh, because uh, the unbelievable destruction which a war could bring if uh, if it oh, if it flares up, uh, but also because it could destroy uh, the whole. Um, edifice of deterrence which we have created, and that's the nuclear weapons could not and should not be used. Uh, if you use nuclear weapons, it will not end up in an uh, all-human holocaust. That would open the way for much more dangerous policies for, of many countries. Because now we are living under self-imposed impression uh, which is about whether we're very positive, and I played a role in play in building up this relationship all year, that uh, nuclear weapons could not be used, and if they are used, they uh, uh, inevitably lead to uh, to uh, the end of humanity. So this is the most area. So, and I must say, and the second, of course, is now Korea, but hopefully we will uh, avoid that. And eventually, we'll come to a situation where there will be a robust uh, system of mutual deterrence there. It will be different from what we have now. Um, uh, but, but then, uh, as I've said, uh, we are moving inadvertently towards a situation where we don't know from where it comes. Uh, let's be Russia, China, and the United States are developing uh, their super, super, supersonic. Uh, crew, I mean, cruise missiles, which which uh, which travel with most mostly lightning speed, uh, and probably we have already developed them. I mean, what if uh, you get an attack on that? We have proliferation of cruise missiles everywhere, and it's not only now. The United States had the predominance in these systems, but now everybody has. Well, I'm happy that Russians have developed these weapons, and when we fired uh, from Caspian Sea and, and uh, to kick a few bandits um, uh, in, uh, in Syria, uh, it was not, we spent millions of dollars on that, on that. It was not for, of course, for, for eliminating these bandits. It was to strengthen our deterrent forces. But we have joined that club. And these cruise missiles are flying, uh, could fly almost undetected. And I think you are developing them with our help. And uh, this world of this technological world, technically, will be much more dangerous. So we have to prepare uh, for, uh, for a different world with unknown uh, um, uh, dangers, uh, which is, uh, a, a, a again, on the basis of growing distrust of major nations, which is uh, of course, which is a, which makes me so pessimistic or concerned about the situation with the strategic international strategic stability. That's why I'm saying I don't think the United States would opt for an attack, or you know, Russia would not opt for an attack. But structurally, the situation is much more dangerous. So we don't know. But then something could happen in the Middle East again, and uh, then then uh, we have. Uh, situation with the uh, with Israelis who are even more concerned. Uh, uh, we have relations with Israel as you have, but they are uh, almost psychotic about Iran. And if something happens there, again, and we no, don't know. Uh, so uh, there are more and more things uh, like that, and technological progress, which have been bringing us closer to. 
uh, affluence and good life. And uh, most people in the world now are not hungry. At the same time, has this side effect, which makes us much more vulnerable to annihilation. Uh, so, and uh, so the technological process, in spite of the uh, fact that we're saying that uh, knowledge brings only benefits, the, tech the knowledge could bring also, I mean, uh, very strong side effects. Even knowledge, by the way, uh, sometimes uh, could be dangerous. Henry Kissinger famously wrote that when countries know each other too well, it's also bad. <laughs> Well, on that note, I'm sorry that a lot of people have been raising their hands, and I know there's a lot of interest in continuing this conversation. But uh, Mr. Karaganov is here for a very brief while, and he has uh, lined up, we have lined up several interviews with the Indian media through the rest of the evening, and then he has a dinner to go to. So therefore, I'm, I'm afraid I have to uh, end this session here. Thank you very much, uh, Sergey. As the Americans say, you earned your dinner uh, and your visit. And we are extremely grateful to you. Thank you. It was indeed a very interesting conversation, which I hope was uh, exhilarating for you, but it, was, it, it really enriched me, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Spasiba.